So its partners, NetGuardians and Temenos, came together to compile an insightful document on the topic of financial crime in Africa. Today we will be covering elements of our new A to the Financial Crime in Africa guide, and we will send you the full guide following the webinar along with the recording of the session and the associated slides, so you will be able to have all the slides and the recording. The elements covered today may not be in the alphabetical order, but we aim to cover off the what, why, and how to tackle financial crime within this region. And today, I have the pleasure to introduce you to our uh, industry experts. These are Amanda Gilmer and John Kipton. And Amanda, uh, she is the Financial Crime Product Director of Temeno. She's South African and she has over 15 years of experience in financial crime mitigation for banks. Her expertise is particularly in sanction screening, AML, and customer enhanced due diligence. John, on the other side, um, is NetGuardian's risk consultant. He's Canyon and based in our offices in Nairobi. Similarly, John has over 10 years of experience in operational risk mitigation, and before joining NetGuardian, he has several positions at Citibank. And today, as our consultant, he's helping banks with their challenges in operational risk, fraud prevention, and risk assessment. Without further ado, I let Amanda continue with her presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mine, for that um, uh, excellent introduction. Um, welcome, everybody, and thank you for taking the time for joining us today. Um, the purpose of this webinar is to discuss the elements um, so that we can all better understand operational risks around financial crime. Um, as Mina mentioned, each of the participants will receive a copy of our A to Z of financial crime in Africa. Um, one of the reasons that we did this is that um, compliance language does vary, um, and it is, it is quite challenging to make sure that, uh, or not to make sure, to, to assist everyone in, in, in speaking the same language and understanding the same risks. Um, hopefully our A to Z will help um, in, in uh, alleviating the, the differences in languages and, and understanding. Um, John and I will be talking about uh, the key aspects around financial crime, um, including internal and external fraud, um, sanction screening or otherwise known as name matching or counter-terrorist financing, anti-money laundering and know your customer. Um, one of the key things that um, we messages we want to get across is that as partners we understand that um, while financial crime costs are very high, um, as illustrated um, on this particular slide, the, uh, we have to bear a fine balance and a fine line between mitigating financial crime and at the same time making sure that financial, financial institutions can handle the operational costs associated with mitigating financial crime. So today the purpose is, is to look at some examples and uh, uh, illustrate solutions to managing the crime but keeping your operational costs effective. Um, I'm going to hand over to John now who is going to discuss the um, certain scenarios around internal and external fraud and how best we recommend that you mitigate those. John, it's all yours. Thank you Amanda for the introduction. Um, a good Good afternoon, uh, participants of this webinar. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Um, so, external fraud um, is one of those facets of uh, operational risk that um, keeps on giving banks and financial institutions a big headache in terms of how to manage this. As you can see from the statistics, generally across the countries uh, listed here in East Africa, uh, Nigeria, South Africa, is that there's an increase in reported fraud cases um, across uh, all those countries, apart maybe from Rwanda, uh, which has seen an all-time uh, you know, low in recent years. And that can actually speak to exactly what is happening in Rwanda that is not happening in other countries. So if you look at it uh, from that perspective, um, maybe just the definition of external fraud is where an outsider is able to manage to um, to penetrate banks' uh, data security and sensitive information and use that information to the detriment of the customers and detriment of the bank uh, in terms of fraud, in terms of um, um, 
you know, weaknesses in uh, branding because now the banks will be in a position where they're at a negative position. Um, so what what is really uh, making this uh, fraud, you know, seem to be increasing in all these countries? It, of course, the legal system is not very helpful for some of these countries. I mean, fraud cases take too long to conclude. Um, if you're looking at uh, the impact in the economy is that uh, the economies are generally showing stress and therefore people who want to you know continue managing a certain lifestyle uh, tend to start uh, you know working with external fraudsters in terms of uh, you know defrauding institutions uh, financial institutions and banks uh, for this case of uh, this discussion so we quickly go into an example of you know one of the ways in which uh, banking fraud will be uh, perpetrated and this is um, e-banking fraud there could be many ways. I mean, there are so many channels that banks offer customers to, you know, to do transactions. And with that pro pro proliferation of, of channels, therefore, the exponential risk also increases. So we're talking about mobile banking, we're talking about card systems, um, e-banking now for which we'll be looking at. Um, and in this example, we have our victim, who's an IT manager in a, in a South African institution. Um, he receives a call from his bank. Um, it's too late um, uh, that uh, he's not able to pick this call. And when he calls back, he's told that he's lost $100,000 because of an unauthorized batch of payments uh, that left his account. Um, unfortunately, this person is not able to even um, get a cent back. Um, so you ask yourself, what could have happened um, to this? Um, one of these ways could be phishing attacks, uh, where he probably clicked on a link um, and this link was able to install um, a malware that steals his credentials for accessing his account. Um, and this is the likely scenario where uh, through a cyber attack, uh, the malware was able to phish for his um, you know, banking logins, uh, understand at what point he's logging on capture those uh, sessions yeah. and able to do 10 fraudulent uh, payments. And of course, the cyber criminals were able to, you know, collect $100,000. All this happened in the span of a few seconds yeah. where a lot of this money was sent to high risk jurisdictions across the world, which have um, weak, um, you know, AML practices. Um, so basically these countries, uh, you, you're not able to, you know, to recover some of these funds. The, the legal system also does not um, very much help in that perspective. Now, so we were able to look at this case and some of the red flags that we picked out is that we saw there were 10 new beneficiaries. Um, of course, the customer is not used to transacting in this particular country. However, these 10 new beneficiaries were in these high-risk countries. Uh, the transactions happened from a never-used-before IP address. The customer is used to transacting from their laptop um, or from their office, and uh, it is in a, within a certain IP range, but this is a complete different IP address. Um, it was a large amount, $100,000, uh, usually not within the customer's limit. Um, all of these payments, 10 of them, were below the radar. So above $10,000 um, would, would necessitate a further review internally from the bank. However, that these 10 payments were all below this threshold because the external fraudsters understand the internal policies of the bank and they know which, which limits, uh, if they transact above, will you know, start requesting for extra scrutiny. All these payments were done in flash of less than two minutes. Unusual to do 10 payments. Um, and the payments ended up in a country like Romania or these high-risk uh, countries, uh, Philippines, um, across the world, each each geography has this kind of countries. Um, so how do we try and help our customers, you know, address these kind of challenges? And as we have seen, um, and it it was even a subject of a discussion in the you know in the U.S. election, cyber attacks cannot be uh, wished away. It's now the new frontier. Um, so criminals do not need guns or use forced entry to access banks and steal millions of dollars. It's too risky. Now, the best way is just to put up uh, a young group of guys um, in these countries that do not have legislation 
or mechanisms to address cyber cyber attacks and unfortunately some of the governments are encouraging this for their own uh, uses now some of these things cannot be uh, managed uh, you cannot this is government risk you cannot uh, or country risk you cannot manage that when you're in another country where you're following all the pertinent laws you know to protect your customer so the only way is for you to give value addition to your customers by understanding their profile so and profiling basically it refers to uh, using big data technologies to understand the behavior of this customer and when you're talking about profiling uh, you know you could easily for example understand um, is this unusual amount so in our case the hundred thousand dollar was an unusual amount nothing in the you know in the profile of the customer abnormal frequency of trade i mean 10 transactions within two minutes the customer usually would not be able to do 10 transactions in two minutes they would probably take five minutes browsing through their internet banking looking at balances so this is again an unusual behavior and suspicious locations we see the money uh, the transactions emanated from a funny ip address never used before could be in these countries um, or could be a botnet which is being utilized from another country um, and this money ends up in certain high-risk jurisdictions. So that again speaks to suspicious geography. And these are 10 new transactions that have never been, been seen before. Um, so this, if you're going to have to profile this customer, these transactions would definitely have stepped out of the normal parameters of defining this customer behavior. Um, on, you can see a graph with many dots all over the place. Uh, basically to say if you use a rule, uh, rule-based, uh, you know, technology, just to put a straight line, am amounts above 10,000 or am amounts above 100,000, then you will probably not be able to catch this fraud. However, if you profile this customer by using all these uh, parameters and putting a risk score to this customer so that if a transaction comes through and does not meet the threshold of this profile, then that will be highlighted. This is the new frontier in managing uh, fraud, not even external fraud on its own, even internal fraud. And profiling is also a technology used in many, many other sectors. It's really the new way. Uh, it is the most effective way to, for you to manage um, any, you know, it's a, it's a most effective countermeasure uh, besides um, all other uh, ways in which to fight fraud, as you shall see in the <coughs> succeeding slides. Um, so we jump into another facet of um, operational risk, uh, internal fraud. This one completely affects uh, most financial institutions. They will always relate to this. Um, and it, not only financial institutions, also private uh, institutions are not dealing with finance. It <clears throat> could be your own company. Um, um, so really, w when you're talking about internal fraud, there could be many ways in which this is uh, perpetrated. Um, but a sobering statistic is that of all your frauds that you're going to experience, 70% of it will generate internally. And this was uh, from the ACFE report of 2015-2016. Um, if you look at all other surveys done by any other companies, uh, the big four, they're, only, they're always talking about the 60 to 70% range. So this is really where if you want to manage uh, quite a big chunk of your operational risk losses, might be a good place to start from. Um, so internal fraud could be perpetrated in many ways, uh, could be the way of financial misstatements. Um, if you think about it, Enron, Worldcom, uh, in the U.S., um, in Kenya, we have our own uh, financial institutions that present different sets of accounts, depending on who is the, who's the uh, end user, is it the regulator, is it, uh, you know, <clears throat> the, uh, the stock market, is it to the shareholders, and that is also a way in which uh, people are trying to hide the funny practices that are taking place. Another way would be internal collusion between IT operations and uh, operations team, business operations team, uh, where they collude to do uh, to change customer details, for example, mobile phone numbers, and then collude with external people who will call in, uh, change passwords for that specific customer, uh, generate payments. And then the IT person will go ahead and uh, delete the logs. Um, so that is one of the biggest ways that we see, and from my experience, I see many financial institutions suffering from. In every fraud, after investigation and forensics, there's always an IT person at the end of it. 
closely linked with a business business person. Um, uh, another way could be, for example, through irregular loans that are or what you call internal loans. Um, and again, this is also reflected in collusion between the management. Uh, could also again end up with financial misstatements. So these are quite various ways in which uh, you know internal fraud can be perpetrated. Um, so the best way to uh, you know we'll be looking at this in the next uh, slide is how do you mitigate this fraud? I mean it can happen. So what should you do to mitigate it? Um, one of these ways um, is to analyze and correlate user behavior. Again, profiling comes into play here, understanding your user behavior. So if somebody is scrolling through internal accounts, scrolling through dormant accounts with no uh, succeeding transaction at the end of that uh, exercise, could be a pointer to somebody who's uh, casing or looking for ways in which to defraud um, uh, your customer, internal customer. Um, another way could be uh, to mitigate is analyze access to important databases, um, whether SQL or not, I mean, uh, J-based technologies, uh, basically uh, no SQL technology that we see in some of the core banking, is the people who are accessing these databases from the back end. What exactly are they trying to do? And you can easily build the, uh, you know, understanding of the IT now person, for example, changing passwords or changing critical customer static uh, information to aid in the, uh, in the you know in the fraud taking place, or it could be wiping out uh, logs so that in the event of an investigation, there is no evidence, for example, to sustain a case, a criminal case, which requires um, conviction. Uh, out of um, you know the judge has to be really convinced that there was a criminal uh, you know intention. Some, the other third way in how you can mitigate this would be in the way of continuous auditing. This is important. We should no longer rely on um, end-of-year reports or external editors to catch for us these issues, um, which again builds into KRIs and KRIs, key risk indicators, to help you understand what is, where is the risk, where should we put our energies to, uh, where are these places where there is likelihood of, of something going wrong, and if it goes wrong, I mean, what's the impact? Could, is it high? Is, is there an issue of reputation, is there an issue of losing money, and so on and so forth. And finally, all this boils down to powerful forensic capability. And this, we are really talking about big data technology, where we are talking about no SQL. So if you, if you look at it with Google, uh, if you do a search, you have millions of responses in the flash of a second. So how does this technology work? It's exactly the same way you should make use of, to be able to help build you know, analytics and forensics internally into your bank or data. And I'm sure Google looks at millions and millions and millions of data. Maybe not, and in any situation of a bank, may not achieve these millions of data. So we can actually use some of these underlying technologies to, to take care of this. Um, so Amanda, I, I think at this point, I'd like to hand over to you um, as you look at uh, some of these uh, operational risks around KYC, AML, money laundering, and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, I think one of the important things to note is, um, is that there are different business imperatives and different costs and different implications of all of the aspects of financial crime. Um, it, I mean, clearly, from a, a fraud perspective, it's a cost for the bank in terms of potentially losing money or, and or fraudulent activities or illegal activities taking place. Um, the subjects that I'm going to be covering are slightly different from the point of view is that there are a cost to the bank, both in doing business, but also reputational risk um, and financial risk. And of course, not, we cannot ignore the size of the fines um, that have, have, have been um, issued by various regulators, taking, for example, um, the latest one from, bank, uh, from BNP, which was in the order of magnitude of $9 billion. So there are different costs associated with it. So one of the big questions is, can you afford to do it? Um, or can you not afford to do it? So the first subject I'm going to be tackling is money laundering because it is, um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, bears some similarities to what John's just been covering on the internal and external fraud. Now, money laundering, as you all well know, doesn't have uh, the same kind of regulatory immediacy um, that something like sanction screening does. 
the, the legal obligation is to report uh, money laundering activities and file a suspicious activity report. A transaction doesn't have to be stopped immediately. Um, but where, again, to John's point about the importance of profiling and the importance of understanding the customer and who you're doing business with, is we use all of the information around how the customers are transacting by using profiles, exactly the same way as you would in fraud, um, whether it's internal or external. Um, so just as a scenario or an example, is that we would use information that where if a group of people are in a similar geography, a ge a geographic, it can be a city or a town, and if there are weekly transactions taking place, and if there is uh, there are common bank accounts between them, common transactions going on between them, it could, for example, lead to indications that it might be a prostitution ring, similarly for a drug ring. And I think these things are really key. So we have segments and we have patterns and we have profiles. So the idea is to use all of this information. John uses the term um, big data. Uh, we talk about it as knowledge management, uh, but it boils down to the same thing. It's using all of the information that you have uh, at your disposal to be able to detect whether or not there are transgressions um, against patterns. And I think you know one of the things that's key uh, um, is, is to be able to really use these profiles um, to specifically and more surgically, because again, I talk about the cost of doing something. Um, you want to spread a, one would like to spread a wide net, but not necessarily spread it so wide that you miss something. At the same time, you want to be as surgical as possible because you don't want to be wasting time with hundreds of thousands of false positives. So it, it's really, really key that, that any system, um, and John talked about also using uh, you know, various spots um, on, on his um, diagonal graph, on, on the trends, is, is being able to use the history over time to be able to detect where money laundering might happen. Um, and where it might be used uh, for criminal activities. Um, the next big element, um, of course, and this is where we see a lot of the uh, big fines, is on sanction screening. Um, it's, it's a very challenging uh, field and, and can be considered to be a fairly hefty cost of doing business. But I think uh, in terms of transacting and regulation, it's only going to get tougher and tougher and tougher. So the idea then is, is very much to make sure that there is um, a large amount of, of agility and flexibility in how you approach it. Now, again, one of the things that we, we talk about is that it's not throwing a product at it is not going to work. Again, what John was talking about in terms of the processes and the people, that's that, that all three combined that have to make it work. It's product, process, and people. And I think it's absolutely key that, that uh, financial institutions keep that uh, foremost in their minds. One of the biggest things, I'm going to sort of whip through a couple of these slides because it's, it's kind of the big picture, but the, the important thing is also the integrity of the lists against which you're matching. Banks have it as a manual process or an automated process. Uh, obviously, manual processes can be more uh, fraught with errors than, than an automated process. Um, and the other thing to go, again, back to John's point about fraud, is the ability to not only manage the public lists, so OFAC, EU, HKMT, HKMT um, uh, South African lists, for example, is also to be able to manage private lists, because there may well be a scenario in which you will choose not to transact with individuals or corporates, because they may have either displayed uh, uh, behavior beforehand that is something that would not be uh, in line with your banking practices or your banking procedures. The other thing is to have a, a powerful detection engine, and this is something that we come across frequently in the industry, is the um, it, it's not one uh, shoe fits all. It's very much a case of you should be using different algorithms to be able to detect different patterns on different fields. Uh, so, for example, fuzzy logic. Um, would make no sense on a, let's take a swift message, uh, field 72, which is a text field, a free text field. So the ability to use different algorithms like literal matching or, or um, fuzzy logic or uh, enhanced recognition or permutation. So for example, I am Amanda Gilmore, I can also be Amanda Jane Gilmore, I could be uh, um, an AJ Gilmore, and things like that, is that the detection engine needs to be really flexible from that perspective, and of course needs to be really, really fast. 
because all of this is, is you know, you don't want to be holding up transactions which might be costing your customers money and holding customer transactions unnecessarily. So the whole, the whole principle behind any kind of automated process should be the flexibility, the agility, and the speed, and, and enable you to control. So that's the other thing, of course, is that with uh, regulation changing as frequently as it does, the, the system needs to be able to adapt to that very quickly. But having said that, equally so, so do the processes need to adapt to that. The ideal would be that the system can adapt quite quickly so that the processes don't have to adapt as quickly, which means the people don't have to adapt as quickly. Um, this slide that you're seeing now is, is about uh, efficient and rigorous hit review. Um, this applies both to anti-money laundering and to sanction screening and to both kinds of fraud. You need to be able to see the how, why's, where's and what for's of, of why a, uh, a transaction may have been stopped, why there is an alert or a hit on it. Um, we need to be able to see where, which lists or, or which uh, uh, rules or profiles or segments an alert was created. Uh, the flexibility to be able to say, okay, well, uh, that one we actually think might be a true hit. So then is there a four eyes process? Is there a six eyes process in some of the really risk averse banks? or whether or not we want to have an automated email because your, your, your compliance department might be quite small and you might want the ability to have an email triggered to an operator so that they know to go and have a look or to an account manager or a CRM manager, sorry, excuse me, because you might want them to be able to contact the corporate or the customer and say, listen, I'm sorry, but there's been a holdup because there has been you know, a trigger in relation to a behavior pattern or to a match against a list. And efficient uh, alert management or case management is absolutely key, as would be done in any manual process. Um, and, and the intention of, of, of any solution should be to automate what would have been a manual process in the most efficient and effective way possible. Um, the final um, element, uh, which again applies across all three um, well, all, all elements of financial crime is um, uh, audit and statistics. You know, to John's point um, about uh, tracking and auditability and not waiting for year-end reports, every single element of every um, scrutiny by a financial crime process, mitigation process should be audited. Um, and this is particularly relevant um, in terms of proving to the regulator the efficiency and the effectiveness of uh, uh, the scrutiny of financial crime, but not only that, to show that your processes are working. Because in having had conversations that we've had with a number of regulators, they actually will be fairly forgiving if they can see that there is process behind it, um, if there is a, a thorough process and continuous process behind it. So if uh, you are, can illustrate to them using the knowledge management or big data or your audit and statistics, you can provide empirical evidence that you are scrutinizing what your, your transactions are, what, what transactions are happening, who's undertaking those transactions, who's reviewed them, who stopped them, why they've been stopped, then that goes a long way to, to mitigating any, uh, any potential fines or, or, or judiciary proceedings in terms of the uh, regulators. In addition, of course, that information can be gathered to create automated suspicious activity reports. Uh, one of the things, again, that we have been talking to regulators about is also, uh, um, they use a really nice analogy about fumigating um, your house. Um, and one of the traditions in the past was that everything was kind of kept a very close secret internally to the bank as to how they ran their compliance processes or their financial crime processes. Banks were very reluctant to speak out about their experiences, um, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and so the analogy then about fumigating the house is that one bank can fumigate its house, but, or I can fumigate my house, but the problem is the termites will, will then just move to the house next door, and so on and so forth. So then we can definitely see that there's a move much more to sharing information um, and, and, and sharing the experiences in financial crime. And a lot of this can be done through audit and statistics. 
because of course the perfect scenario is that five houses will fumigate at the same time, leaving the termites nowhere to go. Um, so I think that that is also something that, that, that's very, very key. And then the latest trend, of course, is um, knowing your customer. <clears throat> the banks and the regulators um, alike are increasingly aware of uh, the importance of knowing, and it, it's not even enough anymore for financial institutions to know uh, who they're transacting with. They need to know who they are transacting with and they are transacting with. So it's, it's, the chain is getting ever longer and there is increasing um, scrutiny on, on who you are doing business with, correspondent banking chains as well. It's not just whether you're not you're a retail bank or a corporate uh, or a high wealth. It is a very much also about if you, for example, are using, I don't know, random example, if say Absa is using Barclays um, uh, on a correspondent banking chain or UBS in the US to do dollar clearing, um, it, it's important also to, to know what their reputation is, what their reputational risk is and what controls they have in place. The big challenge, of course, of that is uh, you know, the legacy systems um, and integrating all of this information sometimes falls into the too hard category um, and it means that there are definitely then um, loopholes. Um, and a big trend that we see in Africa is, of course, is that the, there's a, a substantial growth in client numbers and the, the number of channels that, uh, uh, that are available now to customers. And so this is a big, big point of vulnerability um, that all banks, but particularly Afri African banks, are, are suffering in an, an attempt to detect and prevent fraud um, and financial crime. And of course, the increasing dependency on technology. And all of these can be significant points of weakness or, or points of failure. But of course, with the appropriate people, processes and products, there is no question that uh, uh, these points of failure can be turned into points of strength. Um, so it's a it's a, a more detailed standard than uh, uh, than that was uh, in the past, and also back to John's point about risk and assessing risk. One should really um, apply different risk levels to uh, different types of customer. Um, trans, uh, transacting with Amanda Gilmore, for example, well, one hopes anyway, um, transacting with Amanda Gilmore is potentially less risky than transacting with another customer. Therefore, we'll create different sets of questions that you will need to ask. And then once you get the entire picture of a particular customer, again, be it private or corporate, sorry, excuse me, um, the, the different risk will, uh, will, will be applied. And that then informs any system as to whether or not a transaction is going to be higher risk or lower risk based on the risk profile of the person undertaking that transaction. So it could be, for um, example, if it's a corporate, there's going to be more information required, there's going to be more due diligence required, and if they suddenly, uh, if they have a risk rating of eight, that then applies to the profiling, which says, well, hang on a second, this is a high-risk corporate, it's in a high-risk geography, um, it's got a high-risk uh, um, uh, set of directors, therefore we need to apply a different set of, of rules or, or intelligence to this particular transaction based on its risk ratio. Um, it's, there, it's, it's a, it should be a permanently updated and permanently changing and moving uh, assessment um, of the attributes of the uh, parties that, that, that are being transacted with. Um, again, going back to what I was just mentioning was the, the geographical risk and the customer attributes. Um, it, it, it's, it's very specific and there are procedures and controls that must be done around it and regulators are getting much more uh, scrupulous um, in, in looking at how financial institutions undertake their risk management um, and uh, what they're calling now uh, customer enhanced due diligence as opposed to just KYC. Um, in addition, a lot of this is also about linking, I mentioned it again in the um, um, AML section, is about linking and, and link analysis. So the ability to understand where there are common households, where there are phone numbers, 
Um, and all of this is part of the onboarding process. So, you know, what's your phone number, where do you live? And then seeing whether or not they're common phone numbers, whether or not they're common household bank accounts, uh, whether or not there are relations, and understanding how all of those transact to be able to identify any risks, which again, feed into your, your, uh, your, the rest of your financial crime mitigation systems. So I think we're getting um, towards the end to allow for some uh, question and answer time. Um, I think that uh, John and I are going to share this um, session a little bit, um, this particular slide. Um, I think the most important thing is that the right software should be able to effectively screen or to um, profile or to understand um, any customer database, payment systems, core banking systems, and compare these against uh, a, a transactions, trends, type of business that your bank does. And I think it's, it's the most important thing, I think, is certainly from a, a partnership perspective, is the aspect of education. Um, I think maybe, John, you would maybe like to start off a little bit first on channels and then I can cover off on, on how all of this is applied to, to um, education and, and, and customer intimacy, not only customer intimacy from a partner like uh, Temenos and NetGuardians, but customer intimacy between the bank and its customers and the importance of, of, of retention. So, John, I'm going to um, hand over to you for a bit if you want to... Uh, discuss you know the the how to manage channels because I know that's a big challenge. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, uh, Amanda. Actually, that's one of the questions from the uh, from the guys on the webinar is risk management from an end-to-end -end perspective, uh, which closely links to your uh, question about channels. Um, so channels is just one way of uh, simply put transacting. Um, but there are so many ways. Uh, there's uh, branch banking where somebody can actually walk in and uh, walk in and do branch. You can uh, talk about uh, you know, use of you know money terminals like ATMs. You can talk about prepaid cards and and so on and so forth. So from that perspective, really, as much as we want to look at channels as on its own, I think uh, the pertinent thing is that this, these channels will still be affected by external and internal fraud. And for us to manage those specific areas about operational risk, we have to look at other things, you know, outside, you know, the safeguards that we've spoken about. Number one, uh, very important for any organization is to have a culture of compliance and controls. This I cannot overstate enough. This is the start and the end of everything. If you don't have a culture, you don't have a, you know, a, 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 you know, a culture of compliance and control, basically you're flying blind. Because what does that mean? It means there's no direction from management, there's no direction from the board, um, and at the end of it all, is what you're basically going to be doing is, you know, writing off, um, you know, and affecting your bottom line. So when you talk about culture of compliance, and some of these things is governance from the board. So we see right now, operational risk is a subject matter for a lot and probably 80-90% right now of all uh, boards uh, where they are asking, okay guys, so what are we doing about fraud? Uh, there's a big hit, um, customers are complaining, our reputation is messed up, uh, there's a big fine from the regulator because of a compliance or sanctions uh, breach. Number two, we are looking at uh, management, senior management now taking on board um, compliance and controls as part of their goals. Um, it's no longer about financial performance on its own. We also, they're also now looking internally and saying, what can affect this bottom line? Um, and the goals are, you know, ensuring that operational risk is properly managed. Number three is, you know, things like HR practices. When you're hiring somebody to work for you in a bank, do you know them? Do you know their background? And this is something that Amanda has mentioned with regards to customers. It's not only about KYC, it's now enhanced due diligence. Uh, you have to, to know more about who you're dealing with, not only the person you met at the interview. Uh, why did they leave the previous bank? Were they involved in any malpractices? And uh, not necessarily to do with fraud only. could be poor performance. Because poor performance is some of the reasons that contribute to somebody starting to get involved in these funny activities. Uh, because they have to, they see, they try and justify and uh, rationalize that action. If you just 
think about the fraud triangle where rationalization is one of the one of the facets of the fraud uh, triangle. Um, something else critically is number two is ensuring uh, continuous control, monitoring, management, and measuring. Um, so how do you do this? Uh, you have to put in place processes. And you have to have the right people. Um, so you have things like, uh, you know, annual risk assessment for a start, annual fraud assessment for a start, because you cannot dictate your assessment based on an annual cycle. It has to be an ongoing basis. So one of those governance uh, practices that need to be implemented is, is risk uh, measuring through things like continuous self-assessment, where you have departments come up with their key risks, controls around those uh, key risks, and somebody has to test you know, interdepartmentally as to whether those controls are effective um, and generate results. So once that is done, it actually brings out where should you be focusing on. And the beauty is, instead of even doing that on a quarterly basis or semi-annual, we can actually load all these key risks and controls into a, into a system, a big data system, that runs for you these things on a daily basis. So what's the result? Um, if your audit methodology says you should audit a branch twice every year, you'll find out that there are some branches that require three audits or four audits, and there's a branch that requires only one audit. Because it's a continuous process, you're able to quickly see the trend of these uh, branches. And you can actually tell which departments, which products, which branches, which channels are greatly being affected by operational risk weaknesses so that you channel the right resources in those places. And the other thing with that continuous uh, is link analysis. Amanda has also mentioned that. You need to look at red flags within your, you know, your databases. What are these common signatories between accounts? What are these common postal addresses between accounts? Um, what are these uh, accounts and customer relationships that have the similar physical locations? Uh, it can actually bring out a lot of information that you can actually use and decide to say that we shall not deal with this customer because they, you know, potentially uh, going to introduce risk in the system. And finally, outside all this culture of compliance and ensuring is a process of measurement and management is something we call whistleblowing. I think it's extremely critical that you give your, your staff members an opportunity for them to be able to, you know, give opinions, um, highlight fraud, uh, because as Amanda states, it's no longer about fumigating your house. Um, because if the ants move to the next door, the other neighbor must be able to note that and advise that this is what we should do. So whistleblowing is a very good aspect of getting a lot of information where now the forensic teams, the fraud teams can go ahead and investigate further based on that information. And you know, the staff know each other. They know their families, they know their income level. So if you see somebody driving a big car, driving a big house, or you see somebody who's always complaining about their management and how they're properly not being compensated, those could be red flags. If you see somebody that is coming in the office on the weekend and you think they access an, uh, you know, a restricted area like a teller uh, area, you can actually highlight some of these things for somebody else to do a further review. And this information should channel through to management or action. But this is of going has to be in a very, uh, very private manner, not in a way to jeopardize people's lives and careers because it can get dangerous in this fraud fraud situations uh, where people will probably take um, extra legal actions to silence, uh, you know, these whistleblowers. So Amanda, I can, uh, I think those are the three key areas that I see from an end-to-end -end risk mitigation, John. not only from channels, but from all these areas. And John, talking about channels and fraud, there's also a question from the audience uh, about uh, mobile banking fraud, actually. How prevalent is mobile banking fraud in Africa? Could you just uh, briefly talk about this as well? Yes. Uh, uh, as you can see in Africa, and uh, Amanda had already uh, spoken about it, eight to ten top banks and institutions are now in Africa, I mean, in the world. Uh, their customers are all in Africa and utilizing the mobile banking uh, channel. Uh, obviously, mobile banking, because um, you know, brick and mortar is now being phased out. 
and banks are pushing uh, customers to have this anywhere, anyhow uh, strategy where customers can now transact using the mobile bank. So the mobile technology, uh, you can view your balances, you can, you can even transact uh, funds transfers, um, both uh, internal and external. In terms of money fraud, it is extremely prevalent. Uh, one of the big concerns we see is SIM cloning, where uh, somebody will, uh, underst uh, will uh, clone your SIM card, you will be offline for a few, for a few seconds or 20, 30 minutes. They will call into the bank, um, ask for you know pertinent information, maybe ask for a change of password, um, then therefore start transacting using your mobile uh, phone. Because your mobile number, for example, using USSD, is now what you is what is linked to uh, the banking database, and which will now authenticate that. So if you if somebody does that and they change the USSD, if that information, if the uh, for example the IMEI number is fed as part of uh, reconciliation information from the telco, the telecommunication company to the bank, they can actually see for example a change of IMEI, um, and that should actually highlight a change in the customer behavior. So I would say it's quite prevalent. Uh, considering now that it is the most popular way of transacting in Africa, just like the way in Europe, um, uh, where you have card business, it's, it's very, very prevalent means of uh, transacting, and therefore that's why they're mostly affected by card fraud. So the channel being used mostly, you know, contributes to a very high risk in terms of uh, losses. Um, yeah, so that, that should do it. Thank you very much, John. And Amanda, there are also more questions about education. Could you just give us more information about um, education, how it should be implemented at banks and elaborate a bit more? Sure. Thanks, Mina. I think uh, one of the key things in that we've speak, spoken to the regulators is the importance of choosing the right sort of partner to work with uh, because it's, it, it sometimes is treated as another piece of software. You install it, it's, you, you configure it to work for there and then, and that's fine. And then you kind of walk away from uh, uh, the scenario. And that isn't, that, that's not the case at all. Uh, it needs to be a relationship. Um, it needs to be a relationship where the, the, the technology partner or the solution partner will go back and say, actually, no regulation has changed. Uh, um, uh, and you're not operating at optimum efficiency. You've taken, <clears throat> excuse me, you've taken on board a new customer who's doing a different type of transaction. Therefore, you ought to configure your your solution differently, or you need to amend your processes differently. So I think it's about being educated, both on the regulation, um, in the effective use of the the solution, and as John says, also keeping educated about the people and the processes. And I think that's that's um, uh, abs absolutely essential. The other thing that when we were talking about fumigating um, the houses, as I was saying in the old, sort of you know more recent past, let's call it, um, banks used to kind of put their arms around their own solutions and their own issues, and we're seeing a significant change in the trend of that. Is that, I mean, let's face it, most people, most banks having to do compliance fraud is different. Fraud, you want to stop yourself from losing money. Anti-money laundering, KYC or CEDD. Um, and and uh, sanction screening are about reputational risk. Just as an aside, one bank, once they, uh, one of the big financial institutions, once they were fined by the, one of the regulators, lost 20% market capitalization in the day. So although we talk about reputational risk being a bit of a murky thing, that clearly sends a message that it's not a murky thing. So all of these these trends are moving towards the fact that nobody wants to do it. It's not sexy. It's a cost of doing business. Why throw money at it? Why be innovative about it? Why be scrupulous in using the processes um, that John has described and be able to identify uh, behavior that might be inappropriate? Um, and where we're seeing increasingly now is the banks are more and more willing to exchange this kind of information. Uh, and we're actually seeing regulators where financial institutions um, are being encouraged to share. Uh, there's increasing incidence of, of hosting solutions um, and using similar lists and similar technologies so that that overhead doesn't have to be borne by a, a, um, a, a ind banks individually and they can and share the cost. Of course, the financial institutions still own their own risk. 
but they can certainly share infrastructure, uh, technology, um, and all those associated maintenance costs and the total cost of ownership of, of, of owning an installation. Um, the big question, of course, is, is again with the fumigating and what John was just referring to as channels um, uh, and the differences in channels, this is where I think sharing becomes very, a very interesting debate because if the more and more channels, you can fumigate as many houses as you like, but eventually someone's going to buy an apartment. Now you've got a fumigate of an apartment building, and I'm using this as an analogy to channels, is that unfortunately the criminals, the tighter we and more surgical we get in combating financial crime, they will find another channel. Um, and, you know, with the increase in mobility, particularly in Africa and, and the unbanked, the, the channels will become more and more interesting and more and more innovative which means that the people, processes, and products and solution partners need to be equally as, as innovative. And, you know, the question is, do financial institutions want to be paying individually every time that there's a new channel that comes to the market and that the, this risk has to be mitigated? So I think it's, 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 it's very important that we all keep each other informed and aware. And it's a two-way street. You know, we want to hear from the financial institutions what their pain points are. We know what they are from a bigger picture and a regulatory picture and a sort of global picture. But different geographies um, have different pain points. I mean, having spoken to some of the um, African crime associations, we know full well that the appetite in some countries is a lot lower than the appetite in other countries. And sometimes it falls into the, oh no, it's too expensive, as opposed to the financial consequences of not managing the risk. So I think it's a mutual education process and it's a mutually intimate process. Thanks, Mina. Thank you very much. We are now a bit uh, running out of time. John, do you have any last uh, points that you would like to mention before we end this webinar? Yes, I think there was a question about how um, telcos are also helping us manage these mobile channels. <clears throat> um, there are about four areas they are working on. Uh, number one is uh, KYC um, and AML. So they are using um, there are a lot of mobile money transactions going through banks and telcos are now being screened for this uh, operational risk uh, concerns. And number two, uh, telcos have now improved their technology to feed back to banks in an STP fashion, reconciliation information. So before it was probably an end of day process, but now banks have uh, access to immediate information which they can use for um, you know, for to be able to identify issues that are currently ongoing, as opposed to end of day uh, situation, where it's a bit, it might be a bit too late to help your customer in case they have been defrauded. Uh, number three, they have strengthened the internal procedures for things like SIM swaps, uh, which was a very popular way of defrauding customers' accounts. So that if this for this to happen, you must really, really be, uh, you know, the KYC has to be on point. And number four, they are, uh, the telcos are also closely working with regulators and institutions like the Financial Reporting Center here in Kenya. They are sharing information, um, and this information is now being used to, you know, arrest some of these issues that are prevalent in our society: corruption, bribery, AML, and so on. And finally, uh, they are also taking actions to ensure that um, any person on the network is registered and is known and is linked to, to someone. So I think, Mine, for me, I can close on that and say, I think the end-to-end -end risk management is what will protect you. If you focus on one area of the silo, it might be also expose you in other areas. Uh, so at this point, I think we can, uh, uh, those would be my closing remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, John. So we have now one, we can take one last question about um, financial crime here. Amanda, could you just let us know, uh, I would just ask the question, like how prevalent are attacks involving uh, attacks or applications on the cloud? And there is also one question related uh, on the issue of international cooperation to facilitate consistency of approach to money laundering. Sure. I mean, I'm not entirely sure that I um, understand uh, the first question. Um, I think it's it's more uh, is looking at um, uh, cyber crime and cyber attacks to um, uh, applications on the cloud, um, and I think that that's a bigger question. I'm not entirely sure that this is the right forum for it, but 
it is well raised because, of course, the next hot topic is very much cybercrime and cyber attacks um, because <clears throat> I think, again, it's one of those where financial institutions don't like to acknowledge that they have, have been attacked or have been or there's been an attempted attack. Um, we were at a recent cybercrime conference and, and one of the, um, the, the big four were there and so was uh, the Department of Justice and as you know, I'm sure all aware, Obama has um, uh, listed cybercrime as a potential terrorist threat. Um, so I think, yes, uh, watch this space from uh, uh, many of uh, the software partners. I think it's going to be very interesting, but we need to know what the challenge is before we can uh, help to combat it. So I think there's a learning curve both from financial institutions' point of view and from a partner point of view. Um, on the in issue of international cooperation to facilitate consistency of approach to money laundering, I think that's happening already. Um, I think that uh, more and more, and I think that's one of the reasons that the financial institutions are now looking at uh, potentially hosted applications or, or um, on-cloud solutions as opposed to necessarily on-premise. I think that the learning curve since the Patriot Act in 2001 has enabled financial institutions, A, to work out what their risk appetite is. So how do they want to use it? How do they want to apply it? Uh, what is their exposure to potential legislation, uh, uh, regulatory um, impact? And I think that that collective learning curve, if you like, over the last 12 years has very much helped establish an international pattern of what is considered to be reputationally acceptable as well as allowing the banks to manage their, um, uh, their own risk uh, appetite, which as we all know is the, what is considered to be the risk-based approach. So I think that there are significant efforts, not only by the partners, and when we went to one of the um, regulators more recently, we said to them, you know, you need to talk to the, the solution providers also because it's our job to help you to help people not to do bad things with money. Um, so, you know, let's all talk because let's not forget we're doing this for the right purpose. Um, and I think uh, that's definitely a trend that we're seeing more and more. And I see we're out of time, you know, so I will um, yeah. say thank you very much. Thank you both, John and Amanda. It was a very interesting discussion. So we have still some questions remaining, but we have come at the, to the end of our time, unfortunately. But we will get back to your questions actually by email. Uh, and if you have still any other questions remaining, you can always uh, contact us and uh, email us or call us. We would be happy to get back to you uh, and providing more information and more answers. So thank you all for joining. Thank you both again to John and Amanda. And we look forward to seeing you at our future webinars. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye.